Yes. Like I think I think that the fact that you know your body kicks in and is so aware of all these things and can predict what's going to happen and then like produces a compensatory mechanism as a result. Um, I think that that's really awesome. That, but, yeah, yeah, that that is amazing. It, it just it shows that um, if you want to save money on drinks or drugs, just take a little bit in a different. <laughs> different place yeah i think that only it does it does work but maybe not all the time <laughs> i can't think of any more human activity than conducting science experiments the game i play is a very interesting one it's imagination in a tight straitjacket. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. What I always think should be the basis of education is not answers, but questions. We should teach kids how to question. Uh, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher, uh, which just means that postdoctoral means you've got a doctorate, mm -hmm. so it's after your doctorate. And um, I do research in behavioral neuroscience, um, which is a field that I've been working in for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And I look specifically at rodent models of mental illness. So in a very um, generalized sense, this means that we will uh, genetically modify mice or rats, I currently use mice, um, to alter something in their brain to model to a certain extent um, mental illness. Uh, I can go into that a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and then we look at how this affects their behavior at baseline, so in the absence of anything else. Um, and then we also look at the effect of things like drugs or stress or certain housing conditions on that genetic manipulation uh, to see if there's an interaction between those things. Um, and then after our experiments are completed, we will take out the brains of these animals and we'll look at changes in brain pathology that is associated with the experimental manipulation that we've conducted. Okay, that's really cool. Um, so you, you're, you're manipulating the genes of a, a mice or a mouse, I should say, and then, um, and then seeing how it affects how it relates or um, how that ha interacts with the environment like drugs and then how physiologically that affects the brain as well yes okay now tell me you, you we were talking about um rose liking or you, your your first love which was paleontology <laughs> yeah we never got to what in like what put that love in your heart for paleontology uh i think it was being terrified of jurassic park when i was about seven <laughs> um you know, everyone, when they're kids, they learn about dinosaurs in school, and for most people, they just kind of grow out of that, and uh, for some reason, I just didn't, and I just thought that they were, dinosaurs were really cool, and um, yeah, <laughs> so but I, I haven't continued in paleontology, because there are very few jobs in paleontology, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I should probably choose a career path where I can actually be employed. Right, so how did you choose this one? Uh, well, I did undergraduate psychology at Sydney Uni, and um, to be honest, I just, you know, we had tutorial classes, and in second year, we had tutorial classes where we did rat prac. So we'd, uh, we would, you know, have pairs of students, and um, we'd all train rats to do very simple operant tasks. So, for example, you put them in a box, and they would learn to press a lever in order to get a food reward or like sugary water or something like that. Um, and I just thought that was really cool. <laughs> so I continued along with um, that kind of train um, when I did my honors. Uh, I also really liked uh, lectures on pharmacology and in particular drugs of abuse. We had a really... Um, 
interesting and quite inspiring lecturer, uh, Ian McGregor at Sydney Uni, who's recently just got a whole lot of money to look into medicinal cannabis. Oh. Uh, which was very cool. Yeah. Um, uh, so I really liked learning about how drugs of abuse to change the brain. And I also really liked um, doing these rat pracks. So I wanted to put them together. So I went along to his lab and said, hi, I want to do honours in your lab. Please let me in. And they were like, okay. <laughs> And um, it kind of just, it went off from there. Right. Yeah. And so what did you look at in your honours? <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I looked at the effect of oxytocin, which is the drug that, uh, sorry, no, it's the chemical that is released um, during uh, childbirth to stimulate contractions and also during um, lactation. Uh, and it's like the, the love bonding cuddle hormone. Um, and we were looking at how the, oxytocin could facilitate social interaction mm. in rodents uh, and I was also looking at because I was also looking at automated uh, measures of social interaction just because um, we wanted to basically increase throughput in our tests it's something that is a kind of critical part of all behavioral testing but also other parts of science you know you want to be able to get your data basically as fast as you can if you have to sit there and like manually score. So uh, when an animal does a certain behavior, so you literally sit there and watch a video and press buttons according to what kind of behaviors they show. Um, it just takes a very long time. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at um, develop, developing an automated social interaction task and seeing uh, how well oxytocin could modulate social interaction in the kind of like old social interaction test and this new automated social interaction test. I can't say that my honours was um, that the results were particularly exciting, but I was, I was still very keen nonetheless. So. I'm, I'm curious. So you're looking, so you're giving these rats or mice oxytocin and then looking at how their behaviour changed. Yeah. And how did their behaviour change? Oh, uh, so oxytocin increases social in interaction. Okay. Yeah. So d is there hope for introverts where we just give them oxytocin and then they go out and start making a bunch of friends? Well, that's actually a, a bit of an issue because of um, bioavailability of oxytocin. Um, this wasn't something I was as aware of at the time, but certainly in terms of getting oxytocin uh, into the brain. Um, Get sorry. a little closer, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> you could, yeah. Uh, people have talked about using nasal sprays and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, but Oxytocin is a very large molecule. It's quite difficult for it to pass the blood-brain barrier. Um, and it's also really quickly broken down the body. Mm -hmm. So I can't say too much about this, but I do know that other researchers are looking at um, essentially analogues of oxytocin in order to... That would have, say, the same pro-social effect, um, but don't have the issues of degradation and, and availability. Right. So it could potentially be used in that context. Yeah, so it has been researched quite a lot, particularly in the field of autism. So, you know, like nasal oh. sprays for um, patients with autism to see if it could cr increase uh, like eye contact and um, social interaction, that kind of thing. Uh, and it has shown some promise, but, you know, there are just the issues of availability and degradation and, you know, like, is this, is this only acute effect? Is this a chronic effect? Right. You know, how does it affect the, you know, brain with, like, long-term exposure to oxytocin? Um, so, you know, there are just a lot of issues that need to be dealt with, but it's certainly a really um, a fascinating field of uh, research, and there are a lot of people that are really interested in yeah. this field. That is fascinating. Okay. It, it's just, it reminds me of... Um um, when you talk about drug of abuse, you know, people who take ecstasy, for instance. So the reason that I was looking at oxytocin in my honours project is because in that lab, in Ian McGregor's lab, they had shown that ecstasy in rats increases uh, social interaction in, in a, specific, uh, a specific type of social interaction, which is adjacent lying. It's basically like two rats literally like lie next to each other and they just they just chill there and they don't normally engage in this kind of behavior um with like just normally or uh on any other kind of drugs of abuse um and so the hypothesis was that it was the oxytocin that was increasing that adjacent line um and so that's why we were you know looking at that but it, they had found this you know initial effect of ecstasy um 
on social interaction and on this adjacent learning. That's why we were doing what we were doing. So it was, it was quite interesting ah, that you bring that up. That's interesting. Well, the reason why I bring it up is um, I know one of the things that people do is take 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, um, I think, because it's a oh. precursor for serotonin. Yeah. And because um, if you take serotonin, I think the same issues as oxytocin, I, I think, where it just breaks down, doesn't get to the brain, whatever. But supposedly, if you take 5-HTP, then your body can use that to make serotonin and i believe if you take ecstasy you, you get a depletion of serotonin and that's one of the reasons and i'm totally ignorant about this so <laughs> this is all conjecture or <laughs> speculations i should say but i was wondering is there like a, a precursor for oxytocin that people could potentially take which could boost up your oxytocin levels oh <laughs> This is probably I'm, I'm sure that there is, and it's been a very long time since I worked on oxytocin, so I really wouldn't be able to say with any kind of certainty that I, I would be. I, I expect that there is, but it's just it was quite a long time ago, right. so and I wouldn't want to say something that's um, not. But that's fascinating. These rats are like chilling out next to each other. Yeah. When you give them ecstasy. Yeah, yeah. It's dose dependent, but yeah. Yeah. Which that's is like. When I say, oh, it's dose dependent, and it sounds like it, it is a caveat, but it's also a very true caveat that occurs with um, pretty much all drugs and not just drugs of abuse, but you know, drugs generally work within a certain dose range. You can't just give like endless amounts and it'll always do the same thing. So yeah. um, yes, within a certain dose range. Okay. So then you did your honors um, looking at that. Obviously you did a PhD. How and what did you want to focus on in your PhD? Well, I actually didn't go straight into doing a PhD because um, honours I thought was quite gruelling and uh, so I decided to take some time off and I actually worked in the field um, as a research assistant for three years mm -hmm. in between doing my honours and my PhD and I worked for the person that I work for now actually, um, which is Associate Professor Tim Carl, mm -hmm. but back then he was working at Neura or Neuroscience Research Australia in Randwick. Um, and so he also does behavioral neuroscience and uh, certainly at the time he's, so he was at the time looking at um, mouse, genetic mouse models of schizophrenia. Now he's also branched out and looks at um, genetic mouse models of uh, neuro the neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, motor neuron disease. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time it was just schizophrenia. Um, so I worked as a research assistant there for three years right and, and that was really good so what what type of projects did you work on oh so much <laughs> <laughs> look what's the uh, most interesting uh, one that comes to mind uh okay so we worked with a um a certain mouse model of uh schizophrenia so I'll give you a bit of background to Please. explain all of this yep. so uh, we know that there is a strong genetic component to schizophrenia because we see it running in families. Um, and for example, if you have a, an identical twin, that you have a 50% chance of also having schizophrenia. Right. So we know that you know, approximately 40 to 50% of, uh, we say it's variants, um, is associate, is, is, can be um, contributed to genetic factors. But we also know that there are, but there's another you know, 50, 60% that is caused by something else. And we know that's caused by environmental factors. Mm. Um, and both genetic and environmental factors are quite varied. So there have been a number of very large, um, they're called genome-wide association studies. You basically get a lot of people and you sequence their genome um, and you get like a lot of people who uh, don't have a mental disorder and then you get a lot of people that have schizophrenia and you sequence the genome and then you look for differences mm. um, and we know there are a number of genes that have been associated with schizophrenia people have done a lot of GWAS studies they, they were like the really big thing about 10 or 15 like really really hot you know 10 or 15 years ago um, so what we see across a number of these studies is that there are certain genes that do consistently pop up they're associated with schizophrenia the risk that these genes um, contribute towards schizophrenia is, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, like it's fairly low, you know, it's probably like 1% to 2% risk. But then when you have a number of um, mutations in, say, a number of different genes, then your risk for the disorder mm. does increase. And we expect, we, no, we think that it's, 
that, or I think that the consensus in the field is that there are a number of genes that, um, you know, you'll have a number of mutations in many genes, or sorry, mutations in a number of genes, um, and these all kind of add up to increasing your risk of schizophrenia, or you have a mutation in one very rare gene. Sorry, I should have said that the, the um, m mutations in many genes, uh, they're quite common. Mm. But, um, or you could have a mutation in a very rare gene, and that really increases your risk of schizophrenia, but it's only one. So right. it's like many small things or one big one. Right. Um, so we take a certain gene that we know is associated with risk of schizophrenia, um, and we mutate it in a mouse in the same way that it's mutated in patients that have schizophrenia. So, because what you find from the GWAS studies um, is you're like, oh, look, it's this gene, and perhaps it's this, um, this like, it's called a single nucleotide polymorphism. It just means this part, right. or like, and this part of the gene, and it's changed in this way. Yeah. Um, but you don't know what the gene does. You don't know if it's upregulated or if it's downregulated mm. or, or, yeah. So you don't know exactly what is happening in order for that certain, like, genomic sequence to contribute risk right. of schizophrenia. All so, you know is that it's associated with the disease. Yeah. But you don't know its function, whether it's being expressed more or not ex being expressed at all as a consequence of that mutation in the gene. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Exactly right. <laughs> Sorry, just trying to check <laughs> no, if, no, no, no. if I I'm understand like, that correctly. Stop, stop, stop going into too much detail. No, 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 it's good, it's good. <laughs> so, so that's where we come in um, and we mutate this gene in a mouse and we look at behaviours that are relevant to schizophrenia. You can model behaviors that are relevant to schizophrenia in mice. Obviously it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but there are actually like a number of overlaps and we can talk about that if you want. Cool. Um, so that we can work out exactly what this gene does, how it responds and like how this gene mutation is affected by environmental factors that we know are associated with risk for schizophrenia. These include um, drug abuse, particularly abuse of cannabis because mm. um, cannabis use it does increase schizophrenia risk, particularly in the presence of um, genetic predisposition for the disorder. Um, also, life stress, uh, maternal hypoxia, um, maternal so um, maternal infection, uh, vitamin D deficiency. There are a lot of different environmental factors that are associated with schizophrenia, just as there are a lot of genetic factors. So it's a very the etiology of the disorder is highly complex. We know a lot about it, but it's just it's not like oh, it's this one thing. You know, if it was right. just that one thing, we would have sorted it out already. Yeah. You know, it'd be in the bag. So. It is, yeah, it's, it's really complex. It's a complex interaction between both environment and genetics that lead to the, the symptoms that we see. Yes. Is, is it possible for someone to develop <coughs> schizophrenia even if they don't have any genetic um, variants that would predispose them to schizophrenia? Is it, could it potentially be purely an environmental thing? Yes. So, or I think so. Normally, our current hypotheses are that it could be uh, a combination of genes and environment, or it could be a combination of just a lot of risk genes, or it could be a combination of just a lot of environmental factors. Um, so we think that, you know, often it is a combination of genetics and environment, but it could be solely one or the other, but it's generally more than one of those factors, like more than one genetic or more than one environmental that will culminate. And it often also happens at very critical periods of um, neuronal development, so brain development. Um, so uh, adolescence is a really key time um, mm. in terms of neuronal maturation. Also, we see that schizophrenia um, often uh, develops in very late adolescence or early adulthood. So we think that there's something about like brain maturation processes that are going awry at that point that could either be influenced by things that are happening around that time or perhaps even earlier that could lead to poor maturate or like you know um almost misled or misguided maturation at, at a later stage right it, okay it's, so it's complicated yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's super complicated um what comes it's really interesting but it's really complicated oh yeah for sure you, have you watched a beautiful mind oh yeah Russell but ages Crow. ago Russell yeah <laughs> that that's the first thing that came to mind where he was able to overcome his schizophrenia this is, of course, a movie, you know, so... 
wasn't it based on on the, real the life? physics dude yeah mm. but when i said it's a movie in the movie his wife stays with him and it's a happy ever in reality his wife left him <laughs> he's okay. all alone it's <laughs> sad <laughs> left with his science and no family i think that's what happened so oh, okay yeah it's um <laughs> it is actually a really yeah devastating disorder um also because you know it never really goes away you learn you you can manage it um and you manage it with a combination of um pharmacotherapy and um kind of case management um we it's interesting because a lot of um you know psychological techniques like um cognitive behavioral therapy that are really Mm. effective for things like depression and anxiety really just don't work very well for schizophrenia um so you you really do need pharmacotherapy and um you know like case managers and, and social workers but the disorder can be managed but you know mm. it doesn't ever really go away go away yeah. it can kind of remit but it never really well you, in in a number in most cases it doesn't really go away yeah um so which is really difficult just a question so um how different are the the, the brains of individuals who have schizophrenia versus people who don't i mean neurophysiologically how different is it so that's the really interesting thing. Um, there's no overwhelming pathology, right? Um, and if there were, it would be so much easier for us to know exactly what's going on. So there are some things that we do find in um, patients with schizophrenia. So we do generally see enlargement of the lateral ventricles uh, in the brain. So in your brain, you have holes, essentially, um, which is normal. Um, but we do see an enlargement of the lateral ventricles in schizophrenia. Um, but this is, this is generally found, but it's not super robust. You know, it's, it's kind of like the most robust marker or physiological um, marker that we've found, but it's not, oh, and, and everyone in schizophrenia has this, but also, you know, it's not only specific to schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. Um, Another thing that we, uh, more recently we do find, and you know, this is only something that you can do when you have postmortem tissue, so like after people have died, but you can see that there are, um, there's a loss of um, what are called interneurons, so they're like supporting cells in um, prefrontal regions. Uh, we think this may be associated with cognitive deficits that we see in the disorder. Um, but there's no passively overwhelming pathology that you can see or th- there's definitely no gross pathology it's not like when you have alzheimer's disease and your brain literally shrinks mm. right and and you know you've got all this pathology you, know, you see like amyloid plaques and your fibrillary tangles um it's not like that which has made it so difficult for us to work out what exactly is going on and what is causing all of this and how can we treat it if we can't even see you know, like at a pathological level, uh, sorry, like, um, you know, at a molecular and a cellular level, what is actually going on? That's that's one of the, you know, key challenges is finding out exactly what is happening. It, is it possible that the changes that occur are, are so subtle that we're, it's being missed? And would that mean that potentially the treatment um, would be easier than something like Alzheimer's disease where you have such wide, uh, brain-wide um, degeneration? Or would it be just as complex or even more complex? I think complex? it's just really... It, I think it's as highly complex and it's not necessarily the same... Like, the changes that we see aren't necessarily the same across all brain regions. It's not like, oh, look, we have pathology in the prefrontal cortex and it's there, but, you know, it, like, spread from, you know, midbrain regions and it's kind of the same mm. everywhere. Um, we think it's about that there could be you know, over, almost like over connectivity and like under connectivity, like, sorry, overactivity and like underactivity in specific regions. It's not necessarily, oh, there's like this pathology. It could be about like uh, changes in connectivity, um, changes in activity, which then result in, in the certain symptoms that we see as opposed to like gross pathology, like this, this thing that I see here. It's not right. about like, oh, the amount of this chemical here. Right. 
Okay, that's more complex. <laughs> <laughs> Too much well, nuance for my brain. Welcome to the brain. It's very complex. It's very interesting. Like I love schizophrenia research because it's just so interesting. Um, it's it's really complicated, yeah. but it's so interesting. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. There's a lot of nuance involved, um, and f- 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 you know, from my perspective, a complete noob. It's like, yeah, why can't you do that? <laughs> why isn't it like this? Why isn't it black You're and like, white? Oh, you know, what if it's just simpler? And I was like, don't you think the people <laughs> have thought of this? <laughs> you know, that's what happens. I've had like climate scientists on, or uh, there was a guy who wrote a book um, called A Climate for Denial. A uh, really mm. cool book, yeah. And he was talking. Oh wait, no, he he wasn't. No, he wasn't denying I, I climate. I was just like, yeah. oh, he wasn't supporting <laughs> these climate denials, was he? <laughs> no, he's a really nice guy, okay. and and he was meeting people who, like, he's I think an engineer, and he's got a consulting company that, um, you know, works with businesses to manage their uh, uh, greenhouse gases and energy sustainability, blah blah blah. Anyway, he's like, as soon as he meets people, within ten seconds, he's like, you know, I'm I'm Eric, and I do this, I, I I'm a climate, blah blah blah, and they're like. Like they immediately, first of all, just outright um, are so skeptical that climate change is real. And then they're like, oh, have they considered like the contribution of the sun? Uh, <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, these people spent 20 like, years. They're so stupid that a noob from outside, like someone who's got no training. Just, just, you know, had this really amazing epiphany. That's it. It's like, oh, yeah, no. All these people who are really intelligent, have been working in this field for ages, you know, they all have PhDs, they're, yeah. they're not dumb, mm-hmm. and they just hadn't thought of your really amazing idea. Yeah, yeah no, like, yeah. yeah and, yeah. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's like the flat earth, have you, I'm sure you, you've heard of flat earth theories, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I saw this really great um, image recently, and it was like, you know, if the earth were round, then why don't we have... Um, shoes that basically are like curved on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you have this picture of like the earth and someone standing in these like curved sole shoes. It's like, oh, that makes so much sense. Oh my God. Oh my it's God. like, oh, that's so great. It's so funny. It's like I clearly our flat shoes, you know, support like yeah. flat, flat earth theory. <laughs> Never mind oh, that so the good. Earth was like I don't know how many thousand kilometers in oh, circumference. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, you know the, the Earth is just like it's it's really curved just here, just yeah. a very you know slight curve. Yeah. yeah. I had a friend, I had a friend um, try to convince me that the Earth is flat because he's like, why why do the planes when they go reach this part of the Earth, why do they just disappear from radar? Clearly, like they they're like the Earth is flat. The government does. I'm like, dude. Like, why are you focused on planes? We can do a simple shadow, like a test. Just check the shadow here in Melbourne and you can determine the circumference of the Earth based on those two things, you know what I mean? And, like, the most interesting thing is that people worked that out about 300 years ago, you know? Like, they didn't need computers. They just used the stars and, you know, observations and measurements that you can get with, fairly simple instruments and they were like oh yeah the earth is curved and where you know because i thought that part of as part of like the um uh like voyages to australia they were taking certain readings that would um like i think with the transit of venus yeah and then that would help them to determine I think the size, I like the size of the Earth because they could, you know, um, use a triangle. With yeah, I think it's is it parallax. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. parallax. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. not into physics. No, I'm, so, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, and and they they worked that out three hundred years ago. Yeah, you know that you could use parallax, and yeah. and then you got people today who are like, no, oh, the yeah. Earth is flat. I'm just like, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I think the Greeks figured that like five hundred BC. They, they, they used a shallow, um, I think it was Aristotle, or I don't know who it was, but they would look at the, that stick example, which is similar to what, oh, to what you like said. Oh, kind of like a sundial. Yeah, something like that. But it's, it's a parallax as well. But it's, it's amazing because I think people intrinsically have this desire to discover something new, yeah. you know, and, and they have some secret knowledge that no one else knows. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, humans are really interesting because, you know, we obviously have this really strong... Uh, drive or desire or whatever you want to call it to um, to work things out because you know we just keep on doing it all the time and we keep on moving forward and we keep on taking what other people have 
learnt and discovered and advancing on it. So we've just we've always got this like drive to find out new things, mm. um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. If only they found true things, it'd be cool. <laughs> Even cooler. <laughs> yeah, maybe they don't have to uh, make things up. But, um, <laughs> but sometimes that's easier. You know, aliens exist. Um, chemtrails well, are know, real. I do think that there is... Well, it's interesting. Like, I do think that there's a very... I think it's very likely that aliens do exist in a ridiculously massive universe. It's just they're not here at mm. this tiny little point in this tiny little solar system in, like, some galaxy... Here right now and also you know if they're gonna like, contact us why wouldn't they just come down and be like hey guys we're way smarter than you so we've yeah. obviously learned all your languages <laughs> instead of making crop circles <laughs> like what the fuck <laughs> yeah um but yeah no I, yeah or, I, or kidnapping rednecks and probing them <laughs> yeah no it's also really interesting to see how culture interacts with um oh no sorry like current events interact with culture so you know all these kind of sightings did occur around the time when the space race was really strong and they just put someone on the moon and prior to that time you really didn't have like oh what are these ufos or anything right um or at least they certainly weren't reported as much i think that basically they really weren't reported very much at all yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like oh all of these reportings it's like yeah. gee i wonder if yeah it's it's probably more um people saw things that they didn't understand and chose to interpret or maybe they didn't even choose to but they interpreted them mm. in a way that's culturally relevant and yeah. you know like distinct to that context and and then they're like oh it's a ufo and it's like well it's probably just something random <laughs> and you're you know interpreting it in yeah. that way and you know you notice nowadays that you certainly don't get as many you know ufo sightings or you know aliens abducted me or anything like that so it's kind of like this peak earlier on like kind of around the 60s and 70s mm. and it's really died off now when there really isn't as much i mean don't get me wrong there's still like plenty of interest in space but certainly it kind of didn't impact it hasn't doesn't impact as much like just on normal people like you know the space race was really well publicized mm. and it was really part of like the american psyche particularly back then like we want to be the russians we want to be the first man on the moon that kind of thing um I mean, that's not to say that we're not doing, like, really awesome things in space right now and, you know, Tesla are reusing rockets and all that mm. kind of thing, which I think is really cool. But this is a completely different topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, I was actually reading Elon Musk's um, autobiography. Oh, my husband was reading that. He yeah. said it was really good. Yeah, I, I have the audio book. I, I'm not a very good reader in the sense <laughs> that I can't sit down, so I just listen to stuff. But, uh, yeah, he's a crazy dude. Just believes in crazy things and puts his money where his mouth is. And just follows it. So. Yeah, um, it's pretty. I'm very impressed that he, you know, he could have just sat back after he sold what effectively is now PayPal, yeah, and be like, yeah, I'm just gonna like chill for the rest of my life and have this, you know, just live off my money. But he was like, I have these really exciting ideas that are really quite risky, but you know, if we could actually get it working, they could really pay off. Yeah. And so he invested a hell of a lot of money in it, and and it worked. It's, yeah. It's I think I think that's really gutsy. Um and also I really like the fact that he's pushing ahead with um battery use and like, you know, uh electric cars and that mm. kind of thing when so many governments seem a little bit slow on For the sure. uptake of that. Oh, so yeah. I wonder why. Yeah. yeah Hashtag I know. money in the pocket from the oil companies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know. be surprised. Yeah, Donnie. Yeah, yeah. That's you know every scientist that I have one, and I ask them. And I'll probably ask you this at the end, but you know they all um, talk about how climate change is one of their biggest fears, and and our inability to act on it in uh, you know at, at the right time really scares them. Um, and and it's actually interesting because when I had Eric on, he's like most of the younger generation, so people like you and I. We believe in climate change. We we know the science, and most people you can see it happening. It's the old you, you, yeah, and you you watch the Anta no the Arctic ice getting smaller and smaller every every year, and you're like, oh yeah, this is like totally normal. Yeah, it's scary, but it's the older generation. Um, it's actually the older politicians. Um, it, and who also like they're really invested in mm, the industries that yes. are driving climate change. So, you know. They've got, I mean, and it's probably not all, 
all their own money as well. It's, you know, like investors, like other people that they have to, you know, care about. Yeah. Um, and they've got to think about their interests as well. So I'm not saying this is a, this is a reason <laughs> or I'm not condoning it in any way. Um, but, you know, like they, they obviously have a lot of interests that they need to be aware of and, and so then they don't act which is and i mean the really great thing is they don't have to be alive for it so yeah. they just don't like they can just get out of caring which is really nice right which i'm not so pleased about yeah. <laughs> um but yeah i mean i think if we actually do act we really could do a lot to help to mitigate climate change mm. but the way we're going now we're really just stopped yeah. like we're just not doing anything near nearly fast enough at all so no. it would have to be really quite dramatic change and I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, this just took a... a Sorry. <laughs> no, don't be attacked. Let's go back to your PhD. So we're talking oh, about yeah. schizophrenia. You're talking about mouse models. Yeah. So we were talking about schizophrenia, but then um, I decided to move to Melbourne to do my PhD because I wanted a bit of a change and I wanted to get back into um, looking at drugs of abuse, mm -hmm. which I always thought were really fascinating from when I was doing undergrad and I was like, yeah, drugs, drugs are great. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I, I moved to Melbourne and I did a PhD looking at methamphetamine addiction, okay. uh, again, using mice and using mouse models of um, drug addiction. Uh, so again, we would, so this time we'd take, a, we'd, again, we'd manipulate a gene that we think is relevant to the disorder, but the gene that we chose was not, oh, you know, we took a lot of, you know, people that have like drug, that are drug abusers or like methamphetamine abusers or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, and like analyze their genome, um, because apparently that approach actually hasn't been very useful for um, drug abuse. They tried it, didn't work. Um, so we basically uh, took one of the leading theories uh, regarding what changes in the brain um, in drug addiction. Um, we think that there is um, changes in uh, glutamate signaling. So glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. So it's a chemical that um, makes uh, activates brain cells. Um, it's the main chemical that does this in the brain. Um, and so we took a receptor of glutamate. There are lots. But we took one. Um, and we know that this receptor can modulate um, drug taking behavior in rodents uh, for other drugs of abuse. So things like cocaine and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to see, well, would this work for meth? Because the idea behind it is, okay, if this if we modulate this receptor, um, perhaps with a drug later on, um, you know, in a human, um, could we affect drug taking behavior? So could we make people stop? Would they find the drug less rewarding? Mm -hmm. Would they um, do better uh, in uh, cases of relapse, that kind of thing. Right. So what I was doing was essentially the groundwork for potentially bringing um, a drug in the future um, into the market, which is, okay, does, is, this, is modulating this receptor even useful for this kind of thing? Mm. And so the way that we looked at that was to um, generate a mouse that doesn't have this receptor at all mm -hmm. and look at, well, do they like the drug? Will they self-administer the drug? We can actually... Um, hook them up to a system where they will literally like inject the drug into their um, jugular vein so yeah we do that um, so that we can much more accurately model drug taking that in yep. humans than like for example you would otherwise inject a mouse with you know with a needle and they have no control over uh, how much drug they take or even if they want to do mm -hmm. it or how often they do it. So mm -hmm. with this kind of paradigm, it's called a self-administration paradigm, which the name really says it all. They self-administer the drug right. um, essentially under their own, on their own terms, on their right. own conditions. So, <clears throat> so this receptor, for guys who don't have a biochemistry background, oh, yes. pharmacology. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, it was a good explanation. So essentially glutamate is like the key and the receptor is like the lock. And um, there's different locks that fit that same key essentially and depending on what lock it is it will have different downstream effects on the person or on the on the cell or whatever and you're looking at can we modulate the activity of the specific lock 
to modulate the behavior of the of the mouse or whatever. So if if we change the lock, um, is is the rat going to be more inclined to take the drug or less inclined to take the drug? And you said it was self-admitted. So they they essentially choose how how what degree of um, uh, drug. Sorry, they essentially choose what kind of junkie they want to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tell me what. So um, tell me more about this. So what happened? Okay. Um, so. I'm just thinking back to my PhD, there's a lot of data. Um, so uh, I'm gonna call them our knockout mice because they don't have the gene. Um, so our knockout mice, they self-administered methamphetamine just like our normal mice, mm -hmm. So, which is you know surprising. I thought maybe they, they wouldn't, um, but they do. They're just normal. So, And we looked at a few different doses and they um, self-administered the drug at the same level across different doses. So maybe like higher dose, they may you know, may like it more or less, but no, it's all the same. Um, but one thing that we did after that was we tried to model what it would be like if um, essentially you went to a rehab clinic and they um, helped you to get off drug taking um, and then, uh, you know, and then you go back to like your normal home and then you often relapse because what happens in re rehab is, you know, you go to a different place it's all really nice um, and it's a completely different environment and in that completely different environment you learn to you know stop taking a drug um, they also can teach you like certain techniques for you know like coping when you are exposed to certain triggers or stresses um, and you can also undergo things like cue exposure therapy so that's when you are exposed to cues that normally can trigger your drug taking so for example I might um, go to a bar with my friends all the time and we always go and like have margaritas there and then when I go back there I'm like oh hmm. I feel like a margarita right um, so you can be um, what essentially happens is you are exposed to those different uh, triggers or those cues um, but then in the absence of your drug of choice so you slowly learn that that association <laughs> Um, between the cue or the trigger and your drug is not as strong as it used to be so that over time you can stop associating those two things together so that then later when you see the cue you won't think oh I should have margarita or I should have the you know, drug of choice. Um, so that's all really nice and well and good and you find that you know people when they're in rehab they're like oh yeah I'm doing really well this is great and then they go back to their normal life and then they like relapse really quickly or it's very easy because you're in a the fact that you're in a completely different context makes it really difficult when you go back to your normal context where you've got all these, you know, cues and all these triggers and like stresses of everyday life because we know that things like stress and cues and also just like taking a little bit of a drug can just precipitate relapse. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to essentially like undergo it's um, this kind of cue exposure therapy in the same context where you normally take your drug which is also like it's really problematic in itself because you know it, you could you could also relapse but you know in to actually really decrease that association between drug taking and um, the things that normally trigger you to take the drug you've got to like you know you kind of start out in a controlled environment but eventually you've got to go back into your normal environment and then um, be exposed to those triggers probably with a lot of help mm. um, uh, and not engage in drug taking. So anyway, what we found was we basically tried to do this in mice. Um, so we'd put them in this box where they normally um, take the drug and we uh, there are certain cues that we have in the box. So there's a scent cue, there's also a light cue um, that is associated with the drug taking and mm -hmm. the, the availability of drug. Um, and so what we do is we get the animal to um, Actually, you know, what we did was we took away those cues and we got the animal to, they normally have to press the lever in order to um, receive a drug infusion. Um, so what we got them to do is to learn to like stop pressing the lever. Um, and then we found that our knockout animals were slower, so they weren't actually very good at stopping pressing the lever. Mm. Um, and then we could 
make them relapse by bringing back some of those cues. So bring back the scent cue and bring back the light cue and then look at how well they relapse. Um, and uh, we found that uh, knockout mice, they, they relapsed more. Wow. Then. So this would suggest, yeah, no. Um, this would suggest that, you know, the knockout mice are actually doing worse. So what you'd want to do, um, at least during this um, extinction, like in this uh, kind of Q exposure therapy in this kind of extinction phase, is you actually want to elevate the signaling of this receptor mm. um, in order to facilitate that kind of learning between, oh, look, this Q is now not associated mm. with that drug. And so did you upregulate or... Um, that receptor and see if that's exactly what happened? No, we didn't. Okay. <laughs> that's a hypothesis yet to be tested. Then. Yeah. I mean, other people are working on this as well. Um, it does seem like this receptor does have quite a bit of potential. But again, um, to, to facilitate extinction of drug seeking, it's quite like specific to extinction. It's not, it's not you know, like self-administration, like this earlier part. It's really about this extinction because it's, uh, it's because of the location of the receptor in certain brain regions that are associated with like cognition and learning and extinction learning as well. But anyway, we don't have to get into that. Um, <laughs> and that's why the brain is complex, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> She's been taking it easy on us. <laughs> Shit. Um, uh, but there is quite a, a fair amount of evidence to suggest this, uh, like modulation of this receptor could be quite useful in these situations. But again, it's how do we target that receptor, particularly in like a certain brain region, because mm. this receptor is expressed in a number Other of different brain of regions. Um, and getting some, like getting a, a drug that, you know, again, like penetrates the brain and um, yeah, like attacks the, or attaches to a like, specific receptor complex. And yep. it, it's, it's issues of drug design. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Just what, I, I suppose I'm curious, are there specific regions in the brain that are responsible for um, drug addiction? So, uh, yes. Um, How about we go through, how does addiction happen? Are the new, can you tell us that? Like neurophysiologically, like are there certain parts of the brain that get conditioned like certain pathways, I don't even know if this is, this is how it happens, but certain pathways they get, you know, really, um, uh, the connections get stronger and stronger and, and that's where you have to break. Is that how it happens? Uh, or is that in, a, in a nutshell, <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, yes. So there are a few different things that happen. Um, so quite deep in the brain, um, there's what is called the mesocorticolimbic um, circuit. It basically connects, um, the uh, like um, the prefrontal cortex, which is where you do a lot of like executive functioning and you know decision making, um, with your reward circuit, and your reward circuit is basically from. I, I'm just going to call it the reward circuit because I don't think everyone needs detailed brain anatomy. Um, Limbic system is more about emotions, isn't it? Uh, yes, but it also uh, is very critical for reward processing. Okay. So it's important to remember that the uh, reward centers in your brain are there because they're not specifically designed for drugs of abuse. Um, they are designed to tell you about things that are important in life that you should continue to do. So things like food and social behavior and sex, uh, you know, things that are really critical for, you know, your survival and survival of, you know, the species. Um, so, but the thing about drugs of abuse is that they um, activate these reward pathways in a similar manner to what we see with other natural stimuli that activate these reward pathways, but to a much, much greater extent. Mm. So that's why they're just so incredibly rewarding and you're like, oh, I want to do this again. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so we find that, um, so initially, you know, you'll, you'll take a drug and it'll activate these reward pathways um, and you know, you'd be like, oh, this was fun. You know, generally, some people don't necessarily have a great reaction, but let's say, you know, you liked the drug, so you'll, um, take it again. Mm. And what we find with over time is that, um, there are certain, uh, connections within this pathway that are strengthened. Mm -hmm. Um, and these connections can, uh, facilitate further drug taking, um, what we find is that certain um, 
cues and contexts that are associated with drug taking um, become very or the, the connection between the, that cue or that context and the drug taking becomes much stronger mm. because of the um, plasticity that occurs. This occurs with normal rewards as well. Like if, you know, if you're out and you're a hunter gatherer um, and you're like, oh, you know, I always get, you know, berries from this bush, right? And so, uh, but, you know, there aren't any berries everywhere else. And then, you know, like that kind of, that connection, your brain would strengthen because it's a really good connection for you to make, right? Because mm. then you'll be able to survive. So it's the same kind of thing with drugs. It's just a lot more. Um, we also see changes in the brain in terms of certain chemi um, chemicals that uh, go up and go down um, that can also increase the likelihood of further drug taking to say alleviate um, negative uh, mood states that are associated with the absence of the drug yeah. um, and also we see um, impairment in like prefrontal control of so the reward system um, can be inhibited by your prefrontal cortex and your prefrontal cortex is basically like, no, you really need to like work tomorrow, so maybe you shouldn't go out on a bender tonight. Mm. <laughs> um, but over time, um, that prefrontal control of the like signals that are you know being uh, expressed through the reward pathway and like essentially you know you're craving for alcohol, um, that control is diminished. Right. Um, so obviously people that do abuse drugs know what they're doing but it's very very difficult for them to control their behavior because they literally don't have the same amount of inhibitory control right. over the the craving and the impulses that have been strengthened over time so they know what they're doing it's just it's really hard to stop right so that's a kind of brief overview that's, of what happens in okay. the brain um I'm, one that you said there there's certain chemicals upregulated is dopamine one of them because i know i've heard that dopamine is um so dopamine is so dopamine's an interesting one um because yes dopamine is um released very strongly when you um take a drug and it's it's dopamine release in this reward pathway that signals to your brain this is a rewarding thing um d dopamine also signal signals um, this is a very, very salient thing and you should do it again. Mm. Um, but it's not actually, well, like the, at the beginning, like when you first start taking drugs, like there's a lot of, of dopamine release. Um, but over time, it's not actually dopamine that uh, kind of keeps you coming back for more because drugs kind of, they, over time you do find addicts, they'll say, oh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not really that great. I don't really want it, but I kind of need to have it. Yeah. Um, and that's actually because it's not like that super high that you get, but it's um, it's more that there is um, a problem with your glutamate signaling. So glutamate was that excitatory. It was that chemical we were talking about yes. before. <laughs> um, and um, there's a lot of dysregulation in glutamate signaling uh, in the prefrontal cortex. There are a few different theories on... Um, what is like the key driver of addiction um, but one of the main theories does posit that it's actually this um, imbalance of glutamate that is actually um, really responsible for the kind of chronic long-term issues right. that are associated with addiction okay. right. uh, as opposed to like oh I just want to get high right that's interesting um, I was listening to a podcast and um, I heard that so um, so when we take a drug, there's compensatory mechanisms that uh, compensate for the for that drug. Yep. So um, and that's part of the reason why uh, we can we have to take more and more because our body compensates for it, and so we have to go above that threshold in yep. order to f get that good feeling. Yep. And what happens is that like, so for instance, talk about operant conditioning. So if you're constantly if you're taking seven p.m. at this certain location, you're taking this drug, then you're it's it's almost like your body like kind of it knows, right? And it's like, oh, because the body likes to maintain homeostasis, which is just like that nice balanced set point. So if you're gonna get, take a drug and it gives you this big high, then um, your body's being like, oh no, we want to be home. We like we want to maintain homeostasis. Like as much as you enjoyed that high, no, 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 we don't like that very much. So it's gonna essentially produce the opposite effect and have like a low, which kind of like cancels out your high unless you take more of the drug. Um, so you know it's it's the same thing if you um, you know if you have coffee, right? Like you 
if you have coffee every morning, then like me, you'll get a headache if you don't have it because your body is essentially compensating for what it's expecting and then you don't have it and then it's like, oh, well, now you've got a headache yeah. because of it, because of the expectation that yeah. occurs, yeah. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I've heard that this is one of the reasons why like rock stars overdose in hotel rooms. Yeah, so the interesting thing about, so as I was talking about before, um, Drug addiction is really context specific and you know, all this extinction stuff, it's all very context specific. Um, and so what will happen is that your body is, you know, based on certain cues and context. So it's like, uh, every morning I go to my coffee shop and I get my coffee and then I go to work. Um, and so, you, you know, but if it's a Saturday and it's completely different, then, you know, that headache may not necessarily kick in because your body knows it's, it's doing something different that day. I mean, my headache will probably still kick in, but, um, <laughs> Drug taking is very context dependent. Right. Um, so it's so. For example, with the rock stars, they'll often like take a drug in a certain context. Maybe it's like in you know in in a hotel room, but then they go and then their body like produces this compensatory mechanism. Um, but then they'll go like somewhere else and. Um, oh. So if they go to like say? like a park. They, yeah. They won't compensate for it? Is that what happens? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's it. So they're in a completely different environment. And so, you know, your body's not expecting to get the drug in that environment. So you take your normal drug, but then you don't have that compensation and then you overdose. You overdose. Yeah. Which is like also really cool. That, um, horrible. But very interesting. <laughs> that's funny. Like, I think, I think that the fact that, you know, your body kicks in and is so aware of all these things and can predict what's going to happen and then like produces a compensatory mechanism as a result. Um, I think that that's really awesome. That, but, yeah, yeah. That, that is amazing. It, it just, it shows that um, if you want to save money on drinks or drugs, just take a little bit in a different, <laughs> different place. Yeah, I think that only, it does, it does work, but maybe not all the time. <laughs> You'd have to like keep on changing all the time. <laughs> you, you'll have uh, an adventure every time you go and take drugs. Well, I mean, the thing is, like, if you went, you know, it's like, okay, well, this time I don't want to be at home or I don't want to be like in a, a bar situation. Because, you know, it's not like, oh, only, you know, like you can also generalize to say other bars as well. Mm. Like once you've been to a few bars, it starts to generalize to the bar environment. So then you'd have to like go to like a park, but then you have to, then you generalize to like the park environment. So then you know, you're going to do like go to a swimming pool. <laughs> 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 yeah. Just break into someone's house. <laughs> Don't do that, guys. Yeah, yeah, maybe we're, maybe not that. We're not just, just to get high. Yeah. Maybe just take more drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not condoning drug use. Um yeah. Uh yeah, um you <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm I'm actually it's you know, learning about what drugs do to your brain mm. makes me really never want to take drugs. Although I, I, I drink, but um, apart from that, like I don't, I don't take any illicit substances because they're just, oh man, your brain is so stuffed. <laughs> I just wouldn't want to come back from that. It's just not worth it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting because you've studied meth and I'm sure you know a bunch of uh, stuff about other drugs and, and their mechanism of action and, and what they do to your brain. So you'd have a clear understanding of the risks and dangers involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, uh, I suppose we. It's a shame we're reaching the, towards the end of this um, conversation. That was really fast. Yeah, time flies. I uh, maybe I talk too much. No, <laughs> no that's, that's why we have you on the podcast, Rose. Um, optogenetics. Oh yeah. Tell, I read that in your in your profile. Tell me oh. more about that. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's. Um, it's basically giving you very precise temporal and spatial control of um, the activity of very specific cells in the brain. So basically, if I want to turn on like cell A, I can, you literally, shine a light on those cells and you can like make them fire or, make, or inhibit their firing if they're constantly firing at baseline. Um, and then, you know, I could like turn it on for like five seconds and then turn it off turn it off for five seconds and turn it off and then 10 seconds and turn it off. Um, so it gives you, it's a tool that we use that gives you very precise control over cell activity. I don't think it's anything that you would ever really, well, I don't see it being translated anytime soon into humans, mm. um, but it, it's a really useful and interesting um, research tool that gives us a lot more specificity than we mm. would have previously had. 
Do, do you have to alter the DNA of these cells so that they are um, yes. receptive to, to light? Yes. So you inject a, um, use a, a virus, um, and in that virus you put um, basically uh, DNA from, uh, it's algae. Um, sorry, I did this like a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> But um, because that uh, algae is light sensitive, um, and so then you inject that in, we put it into, we package it into a virus just because that will be easily accepted by the host cell, which mm -hmm. is the, you know, brain of the animal that you're working on. Um, and so you inject that into a very specific, um, brain region, and then you wait for that, um, for the, um, virus to be taken up and then to insert its... DNA into the host cell and then the host cell starts expressing the DNA of the virus. Uh, and then so you basically just wait three weeks um, and, uh, and then you can um, you use a cannula to shine a light onto the, those cells and you can turn them on and off. And the cool thing is you can, because what happens in the brain is that cells from one area will project or well, they'll connect up with another area. Mm. Um, so what you could do is you could put the virus into like area a and area a connects up with area b and you could actually shine the light on area b to target this very specific connection between a and b oh. that you wouldn't get otherwise like if you just shine the light on a then you'd get like activity in a but a could like activate b and c oh. and d so what we do is we can target this very you know if we think oh this pathway is very important in xyz um we could just target this very specific pathway wow that is so sick yeah it's really cool yeah um, you, the reason I, I, I was listening to Radio Lab, I'm not sure if you've heard yeah. of it's a great podcast, but they were talking about how they were shining, they were using, I think, optogenetics essentially in mice to treat or mitigate um, the, uh, the, the symptoms of Alzheimer's in mice. Oh. So they found that if they just shine light in the brains of these mice at a certain hertz, um, certain frequency then what happened was I think the microglia in the mind in, in the brain was getting activated and uh, cleaning up all the beta amyloids yeah yeah and then they eventually okay. found that they didn't even need to stimulate the brain um, directly they could put these mice in these in this box filled with LED lights uh, certain yeah I think like to an ex I have seen some papers where they can shine light and the light will like penetrate to a certain depth so it won't maybe not go all the way through but certainly into a certain depth even if it's not like directly there it's just like oh you know it's, it's kind of like outside mm. of the head which is really cool yeah well i think in, in in this episode they were saying that actually they're achieving the same results just through the vision so exposing these mm. mice to this frequency of, of flickering of the light somehow causes um the brain to achieve a certain brain frequency, you know, there's alpha, beta, all this other stuff uh, that I'm completely ignorant about. But essentially, just getting it in a certain frequency that normal people brains are uh, working, um, it induces, you know, this cleaning up process by the microglia. And I could totally have gotten that wrong, but uh, for the folks, just listen to the episode. Um, I mean, I, th I, yeah, I don't know. That's really cool. Uh, I think that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily take that technique into patients with Alzheimer's disease, but perhaps the mechanism, which is the like upregulation of microglial function in like specific brain regions, um, that could definitely be something that you could, you know, like target say with a drug or something, just because um, to, you know, be able to activate the microglia in that way, you would have to like inject a virus into a human like brain region and, you know, like alt manipulate the DNA in that region. Right. And, I think that a lot of people would have strong ethical concerns about that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. And not, not everything, um, talking about mouse models, not everything that works in mice typically works in humans. No. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that there, yeah, uh, there is an issue with translation of findings. Um, this is a really, like, complex, quite faceted issue that I don't think we really have time to go into. But... Um, <laughs> I honestly do believe in the utility of mouse models, but um, no, sometimes they don't always translate perfectly. Yeah. Okay, last two questions. Um, uh, okay, the first one is when you look into the future, and what are you most afraid of 
and the flip side of that, what are you most hopeful of? Ah, I'm most afraid of uh, not having any money and having to leave science. <laughs> and <laughs> because the funding situation is um, not the best. And What is the funding situation? Oh, uh, it's just that. So the major um, uh, grant provider, uh, so the National Health and Medical Research Council, which is basically like, it's the government support of medical research and it's the main funding body for medical research. The success for um, project grants, which are the main kind of grants that you get, uh, is very low. It's about, I think last time it was actually 16%, but before I think they were suggesting it was 12 so it's very low, and these are three-year grants. Although things are changing, so mm. maybe it'll change. Um, but science is highly, science is just highly competitive, and I'm afraid that I will be not competitive enough. I try, but you're up against other people that are also trying really hard as well, and mm. highly talented, and very smart. So mm. um, I'm afraid of of essentially not being able to make it. Um, and I accept that that may happen, and if it does, well, I'll just go into something else. But uh, I would be hopeful to start my own lab. That would be very nice. That's what I am trying to do. Nice. Are you taking on any research students supervising? Yeah. Uh, I'm very open for research students, so if anyone wants to contact me, please go ahead. Um, I'm just starting to take on students, so I would like to take on more. I've got one PhD student that's lined up for next year, but I'm certainly very open to masters and honors students. Great. Um, what type of projects would you have available? Uh, we're probably going to be looking at um, drug abuse in mouse models of schizophrenia. Um, so how do these mice respond to different drugs, different doses of drugs using various paradigms, some of which we've described today. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Rose. I really enjoyed the conversation. It was really fun. Thanks yeah. for having me.